So we have a pretty good idea of what planets look like. We also have a pretty good idea of what um, some of the solar system looks like from the outside. Specifically here, if we were to move out uh, to the point where the Neptune orbits, we do have a good understanding of that particular shape. But the thing is, the solar system is technically defined by the so-called heliosphere, which scientifically is defined as the sphere of influence of our Sun. Normally, this sphere of influence is created through various magnetic interactions, specifically through the release of the uh, very strong solar winds and a lot of other particles from the outside interacting with the particles coming from within. So in some sense, this is kind of what we believe the whole thing looks like. And the thing is, both Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 probes left this particular heliosphere and are now traveling in the so-called interstellar space. And this is why we finally were able to actually start analyzing the shape of this heliosphere and even try to understand what's really happening on the inside as opposed to the outside. You may have already seen the video I made previously about the Voyager probe, and more specifically Voyager 2, which is somewhere right here in the location in the solar system, actually just outside of the solar system. And as Voyager 2 was leaving the heliosphere, it discovered that there was a lot of really, really hot plasma. I referred to this back then as a kind of a firewall, because technically fire is also plasma. And so essentially these really hot particles are extremely unusual and they're present right here in front of the heliosphere, forming a kind of a, well, firewall. And all of this is actually formed because the solar wind, as it's being expelled from the sun, creates a kind of a pressure right in front of the sun as it travels across the galaxy. And the interaction between the particles from the outside and the particles from the inside do create this unusual phenomenon in front. But the thing is, there's not a lot of particles here. Um, usually there's approximately one particle per cubic centimeter, which is about this big. So these environments are really low in density. But this here is a little bit more dense and the area within the heliosphere is also a lot denser as well. So it's kind of like an interaction between higher density and lower density regions, while at the same time the interaction between different types of charged particles. And we also understand that heliosphere is pretty much essential to the survival of life on our planet. It does protect life from a lot of cosmic rays from outside of the solar system that would actually most likely increase the radiation on our planet dramatically. But because of the heliosphere, we're protected and sort of sheltered from all of this dangerous radiation from outside. And in terms of the actual distance uh, to, I guess, the border of heliosphere, it's approximately 120 astronomical units, which is about three times the distance of Pluto to the Sun. Or, I guess, 120 times the distance of Earth to the Sun. So it is pretty far away, but understanding this heliosphere and, of course, its shape is really important when it comes to understanding solar systems, or star systems, and also just in general the interaction between various really highly charged particles, and, of course, how all of this relates to the protection of our own planet. But for the longest time, we always believed that the actual shape was more comet-like. Basically, sort of like this. And a lot of this evidence came uh, from other stars. For example, this is what one of these stars looks like if you were to look at it from, um, from here, from Earth. And it does seem to appear like a comet-like um, environment. Basically, you get a comet-like shape and this unusual formation in front of it, which is formed by the star's heliosphere. A somewhat similar example can be seen right here, uh, near the star known as LL Orionis. And you can kind of see that it does seem to form this comet-like formation as well. But I think one of the best known examples is the star known as Mira, where you can definitely see how comet-like it seems to appear. And the thing is, we've always believed that this is pretty much what solar system would have as well. Which is why all of the NASA analysis always sort of makes it this, this kind of a shape. But turns out that we might have been wrong, and mostly because of these, some of the more recent observations from other probes, like for example Cassini and New Horizons. And it all began with the analysis of data from the Voyager probes, and uh, essentially back in 2015, using a lot of data from the Voyager probes, some of the scientists were able to emulate what uh, the potential heliosphere looks like, and the shape that they got was actually this. It was a little bit of more of a crescent than a comet. And even though it still sort of resembles a comet-like formation, it's really more of two uh, very specific, very unique shapes on two sides. So in other words, right in the middle, there was pretty much nothing. The heliosphere sort of ended right here. And this model was uh, not really well received at first because it didn't really add up with some of the other information we had. Because a few years later, uh, the Cassini probe was able to create another model, and that model seemed to predict that the actual shape was almost perfectly spherical. And in some sense, this contradicted the first assumption. 
But now we have even more data, and this time it's from the New Horizons mission that is technically still inside the solar system, but it's on the way out, and it's already been able to collect quite a lot of various data in regards to heliosphere as well. And the main difference uh, between this new model and previous models is that it actually made a really interesting assumption. It essentially divided all of the charged particles that it was able to detect into the ones coming from within the solar system and the ones coming from the outside. Before that we kind of just assumed that they were all the same, but now we know that they're not, they're actually coming from two different directions. And some of these particles that are coming from the outside could also be neutral at first, they actually might have no charge, and because of the interaction with the heliosphere and the sun and other cosmic rays, might eventually become charged with time. And the main discovery of the New Horizons mission is that these external particles that were captured from the outside of the solar system eventually become much hotter and much more energized before essentially, I guess, turning around and then following the solar wind on the way out of the solar system. So in other words, there's a very interesting interaction between the external and internal particles, and they do create these unusual, well, technically kernel-like formations, which is essentially the unusual shape that you see right here. These unusual currents are formed through the interaction of different types of charged particles as they essentially move around the heliosphere and then slowly get carried out of the solar system completely. And so by modeling two different types of particles, the researchers behind the paper you can find in the description below discovered that it probably resembles something like this. Basically a combination of a perfect sphere that we detected previously and a crescent shape that we also detected previously as well. In other words, it's a combination of two and it does seem to reconcile both theories pretty well. With the only major difference being that inside of the sphere, we'll find two different types of particles at least. So some of the cooler particles coming from the solar wind and some of the more hot particles that came from the outside and got charged by the solar wind and are now being carried out. And even though this is just a model for now, we're not entirely sure if this is exactly what it looks like. This will definitely give us a reason to kind of zoom in a little bit more to some of these other stars we're looking at and try to identify if something similar is happening in there as well. Mostly because we believe that this interaction between the heliosphere and of course the external uh, particles that are coming from outside of the solar system are absolutely essential for an ability of a solar system or a star system to maintain at least one planet similar to planet Earth and its ability to actually protect it from the radiation from outer space. In other words, the heliosphere is absolutely crucial for having habitable planets, and we think that studying heliosphere and understanding what makes the solar system so different is really important for us in trying to find other stars that might actually have similar planets. Because today, scientists still think that our solar system is a little bit weird compared to everything else. And maybe having a different heliosphere is actually one of these unusual phenomena that other stars also don't have. So this is something we want to learn a little bit more about, just so we can look for other stars similar to our sun. But unfortunately, except for this model of this shape right now, that's kind of all we know about our own solar bubble. Once we discover other stars that have their heliospheres visible and once we can compare them to some of the other discoveries we make in the next few years, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video because this is a very very important topic for the discovery of other habitable planets. And also I'm sure as different probes such as the New Horizons probe also end up leaving the solar system and past the boundary of about 120 astronomical units, essentially leaving the heliosphere, we're going to be able to discover even more things about the strange and unusual shape of the bubble we live in. For many years now I've been speculating that we're going to find even more signs of life on Venus. And, well, looks like we got what I was asking for. Hello wonderful person, let's talk about this new discovery, new very exciting discovery that suggests that there might be something happening on Venus after all. But I'm not going to go on a limb and say that this is life for sure, because it could be something else. Let's talk about this in a little bit more detail. And begin with a cautionary tale of the past from our neighbor Mars. You might remember back in the 90s, Bill Clinton made a pretty famous by now announcement suggesting that we found life on Mars, all of which was based on the discoveries coming from an asteroid we discovered in Antarctica that did come from Mars. This is sort of what we found there. These formations that you see right here from the asteroid known as ALH or Allen Hills 84001 were, according to some scientists, the signs that life, bacterial life, 
existed on Mars. And this, by the way, was back in 1996. Now, back then, I was about to start college and I got very lucky to work with one of the professors who was working with different asteroids and who was also trying to investigate ALH 84001, but he was doing it from a scientific perspective, trying to see if anything else can actually produce similar effects and trying to find some other signs suggesting that this is not life. Now, years later, actually decades later, we know that this was not signs of life at all. This was a chemical reaction that was successfully recreated in the lab as well. So, in some sense, the premature announcement that we found life on Mars is a really good warning for us that we should not rush into saying that we found life on Venus as well. The one major thing that came out of this study was that we should not use morphology, or shapes in other words, to suggest that life was found. Because if something looks like life, it doesn't really mean it's life. On the other hand, if something smells like life, is it life? Well, chances are that it can still be just a chemical reaction. Which is pretty much what we found on Venus now. So, we found these molecules known as phosphenes, not to be confused with phosphenes, which apparently is spelled just a little bit different, but means a completely different thing. So we're talking about this, not this. This here refers to a psychological perception of light without any light being produced. So in other words, this is a completely different concept. This here is a molecule, and this molecule is also extremely toxic. As a matter of fact, in the last few years, several major incidents occurred when this molecule leaked somewhere, resulting in several fatalities, and this is something that actually happens every few years here and there. So this is a pretty dangerous gas. But how can a dangerous gas be connected to life? Well, it turns out that here on planet Earth, the only way we've discovered that this gas is produced is with certain bacteria, so-called anaerobic bacteria that does not require oxygen. A lot of different types of these anaerobic bacteria exist on our planet, some of them can even be found inside of you right now, inside of your guts, and they do produce all sorts of different gases. By the way, completely not related, but that's exactly where the gas comes from when you pass gas. It's the anaerobic bacteria producing all sorts of stuff inside of you. But certain bacteria do produce phosphine, and for what reason we don't really know. There have been speculations that maybe it's used as a kind of a protection, because it's toxic, maybe some bacteria use it to kind of cover their area with it so that other bacteria don't get in there. And so it could be used as a sort of a protection for various types of bacteria, or it could be just their waste. We don't really know what phosphine is for. But we do know that on Earth, no geological or chemical process ever produces it. It's always bacteria. It has even been suggested that phosphine is a very important part of the phosphorus cycle on our planet. Essentially, this is how phosphorus is recirculated and reintroduced back for other life to use. But all of these are very early assumptions because we just don't know enough about it. But then again, we've actually found phosphine on other planets. Specifically, our large cousins Jupiter and Saturn. Both of these do contain a lot of phosphine. And so today the scientists believe that it can be produced in extreme conditions in these gas giants. Extreme pressures, possibly extreme temperatures do produce phosphine in inorganic ways. Which, once again, takes us back to Venus. As it usually happens in science, this was a completely accidental discovery. As a matter of fact, the scientists were almost doing the opposite. They were using this beautiful telescope known as James Clerk Maxwell Telescope to try to rule out extreme scenarios and to try to establish a kind of a base for what we should be looking at when looking at other planets. Now, this telescope is able to observe in sub-millimeter range and is able to see certain wavelengths in extreme precision. And it just so happens that one of these wavelengths is apparently the absorption spectrum of phosphine as well. Now, this is where I actually don't know enough about chemistry to speculate that maybe there is another chemical out there that could be similar to phosphine in that sense. So if you do know enough about chemistry, please let me know in the description because maybe it's just a chemical that's very similar to phosphine, has a similar absorption spectrum that's not phosphine. Anyway, long story short, they used the telescope, they looked at Venus, specifically the absorption spectrum, and they saw the spectra that are very similar to phosphine. And this, of course, was very unexpected. They did not expect to find this in the atmosphere of this planet. Now, you might have seen my older video from a few months back based on another paper 
that very strongly suggested that phosphine can only mean alien life. And in retrospect, I sort of regret making the strong statement, because now I'm doubting myself. What if there are ways for phosphine to be created inorganically, and what if Venus actually has one of these conditions for phosphine to be formed? Now, right now, our understanding of how chemistry works on other planets is not particularly good, because we haven't really been able to create a lot of situations where Venusian conditions, for example, are recreated. And here we are, of course, talking about about 93 atmospheres of pressure and almost 500 degrees Celsius of temperature. So in that sense, maybe there is something going on here that makes this possible without any bacteria whatsoever. But then on the other hand, if you've been on the channel long enough, you probably know that I'm a strong believer and a proponent in thinking that there is definitely life on Venus. I'm just not entirely sure that this was the sign of it. Maybe one of the signs, but not a definitive sign. And by the way, a lot of the speculations and a lot of the ideas behind the life of Venus began when we started observing unusual formations inside the clouds of Venus that were absorbing the light coming from the Sun in a very unusual and very peculiar manner. These so-called light absorbers, as they're known today, are still a mystery and are definitely yet another sign that life could be present on Venus after all. But the other obvious reason why we believe life is totally possible here is because life can exist in the upper atmosphere. One of the previous papers I've mentioned had this beautiful illustration in it suggesting that, well, right around here, around 50 to maybe even 70 kilometers above the ground, is where life can definitely exist and even thrive because we get about one atmospheric pressure, which is similar to Earth, and the temperatures are also very similar to what we have on the surface of the planet. The only difference being that it's also a little bit more acidic. But we also know that here on Earth we have extremophiles that absolutely thrive in acidic conditions. We found them everywhere on the planet, especially in extreme, very hot, very acidic places. The most famous example, of course, is the Yellowstone National Park, which is what you see right here. And these bright colors are all bacterial in nature. This is all produced by all sorts of different extremophiles. So in that sense, finding life in there is totally not unusual. It's just we haven't really had enough signs of life yet. We have visual signs, now we have chemical signs, but we're still missing some. In other words, it can still be a chemical reaction of some sorts. And because we've learned a lesson from the Martian announcement that was premature and did not involve any life found, we now need to take a little bit more caution. But luckily for us, there's at least one mission that's currently very actively investigating the potential presence of life on Venus, at least from the perspective of atmosphere. Japanese Akatsuki is still there, it's still actively getting a lot of data from Venus, and in the next few years we're going to get enough data from the upper atmosphere of Venus to maybe make other conclusions and come up with some other explanations for what we're observing here and why phosphine is present. Maybe it's some sort of a solar reaction for all we know. So we're not going to rush into saying that this is definitely life. It's very likely life, like I've been saying for years, but not 100% yet. And the only way we're going to be certain about this being life is only if we launch something like this to Venus that's been suggested for decades now. As a matter of fact, Soviet Union was able to launch a balloon with an actual detector and a sensor back in mid-80s. That was like 35 years ago, I think, even more than that. So the technology is definitely there. Why haven't we done it yet? Well, there is no political pressure, there is no public interest, and most importantly, there's just no will, no desire to go there from any major organization. And those that possess the ability to go and have the will are going to the wrong place. Elon Musk? Seriously. Mars? No. You gotta go to Venus. But let's just assume for a second that this is indeed life and they're basically eating all of the stuff in the atmosphere and producing phosphine for one reason or another. How are they doing it? So there are still quite a lot of mysteries here. First of all, where is the hydrogen coming from? Phosphine is basically phosphorus and hydrogen. And we don't really know where either one of these molecules is coming from in the atmosphere. We know, for example, that there is oxygen and the oxygen is being lost by the planet. We've seen this as a kind of a tail coming from Venus. And in some sense, we know that there are acidic conditions, which usually include hydrogen. So whatever is happening there has to be getting hydrogen from these acids. And right now, once again, the best explanation turns out to be bacteria yet again. 
acidic extremophiles specifically. They would love to use acid and get all of the hydrogen from those acids. But what about phosphorus? Well, on Earth, phosphorus is in a kind of a cycle. The bacteria get phosphorus from other organic matter that they consume. Is that what's happening on Venus as well? Do they have other organic organisms circulating in the atmosphere that this bacteria eats? That's kind of what sort of is being implied here. At least that's if we use our earthly comparison. Chances are, whatever is happening here is, for the lack of a better word, alien. But what's really interesting about this discovery is that the scientists found a lot of the phosphine in the atmosphere. The amount they discovered here translates to about 20 parts per billion. And though it doesn't sound like a lot, according to the scientists behind this paper, that's about 10,000 times more than any chemical reaction would produce anyway. So if this is a chemical reaction, it's an extremely active chemical reaction that, once again, we don't really know how to explain right now. On top of this, phosphine doesn't really stay stable for a very long time, especially when there's a lot of ultraviolet light, such as there is in the upper atmosphere of Venus. In this case, phosphine molecules end up being destroyed and consumed by either water or carbon dioxide, and there's a lot of carbon dioxide on Venus. So in that sense, Unless something is replenishing phosphine in the atmosphere, it shouldn't exist once again. In other words, the more we try to explain this as some kind of a chemical reaction, the more it seems that it's not. It is very difficult for us to currently explain this without invoking alien life. Which honestly makes me super happy. This is one place I was hoping we would find life. For a very long time. But despite my excitement and despite my enthusiasm, I'm still going to be a little bit skeptical, simply because of that announcement by Bill Clinton, which to this day is still there on NASA's page. And that is a good reminder for us to be really careful this time. So even though maybe in my heart I believe that it's life, my brain tells me otherwise. My brain tells me to be very careful. And hopefully your brains will tell you the same. But hypothetically, let's assume that this is life. Well, if this is life, we suddenly have a lot of other topics to talk about. For one, panspermia. Did this life come from Earth? Or vice versa, did the life on Venus create life on Earth later on? Many modern studies suggest that Venus looked something like this billions of years ago, so it did have habitable conditions. If it was created here first and then transferred to Earth, that would actually be really exciting for us to study because we would get to see what ancient bacteria looked like. Also, since according to the scientists the detection of phosphine happened exactly in the habitable zone of the atmosphere of Venus, the follow-up question here is of course, well, what other types of life are we going to find here? It's very unlikely that there's just going to be one type of microbe living here, it's very likely that it's a community that sort of circulates and recycles materials from one another. Which would of course solve the mystery of where the hydrogen and the phosphorus come from. So definitely a lot of exciting questions possibly a lot of exciting studies and discoveries in the next few years. But what I'm hoping for is more missions. A lot more missions. Honestly, forget about Mars, at least for the time being. Let's focus all of our attention on Venus and try to find what we can discover there. Now, NASA currently has at least two major missions planned for Venus, but they're still in a far enough future. One of them, the Veritas mission, is going to hopefully have a lander that will hopefully explore the surface of Venus. A few months ago, I made a video that you can find somewhere above my head that talked about the absolutely incredible competition and designs that NASA was able to collect from all over the planet that are hopefully going to result in an incredible new invention, essentially a kind of a robot, mechanical robot that has no electronics on the inside that's going to go to Venus and explore it. But that's in the future, possibly in the next five years or so. For now, we don't really have anything going on for the next two years, so this is where we need private companies. Possibly SpaceX, maybe some other company, Electron, maybe you guys. Anyway, someone needs to go there and find out what's happening. And all we need is just a tiny balloon. Something that can go into the upper atmosphere, grab a few samples and return them back to Earth. The Soviet space program was able to achieve this back in the 80s, but they had an active balloon system. So building from that should not be too difficult. We definitely have the technology for this. So, if all goes well, in the next 5 years, we'll have the answer to the question of, is there life on Venus? As humans, we have a very unhealthy fascination with the idea of time and timekeeping. 
why is it that we like to keep track of time? Why do we count minutes? Why do hours and seconds and minutes exist? What is it about time in general that makes it such a universal concept? Well, it's actually a kind of an interesting philosophical slash anthropological question, but it's also kind of important to understand the evolution of time throughout different human civilizations. Hello, wonderful person, this is Anton, and happy 25th solar cycle to you. Today, we're going to be talking about the idea of solar cycles and how it relates to the idea of timekeeping, and also what all of this means in the bigger picture of timekeeping and time tracking that our civilization depends on. But let's begin with the history. So I tried to look up and try to discover where the idea of timekeeping actually started. It's surprisingly difficult. What is not difficult though is understanding that the idea of timekeeping and time tracking is a uniquely human concept. And it's also something that in a sense defines the human civilization as a whole. When the humans started to keep track of time, that was technically the beginning of human civilization. But pinpointing that exact moment is a little bit difficult. For example, a very famous location known as the Semliki Valley, located in the Republic of Congo, which as always we can visit by using Google Earth right here, and it's located somewhere in this region here, seems to contain some of the oldest human tools, specifically hunting tools, that were ever discovered. Some of these tools seem to be roughly around 80,000 years old, meaning that humans were hunting here for a very long time. And within these tools, the archaeologists also discovered certain bones that possessed markings indicating different days and essentially time measurement. So today we believe this was the first attempt by humans to measure time in general. And in this case, the time measurements were somehow related to the hunting or possibly some other migrationary patterns that humans discovered. And this is essentially the main premise for the idea of timekeeping. Timekeeping allows us to keep track of different patterns that we discover with our incredible human minds. As we discover these patterns, we want to be able to predict them. And through the prediction of these patterns, we advance our civilization. At least, that's my very humble and possibly somewhat ignorant interpretation of this. And what started with bones and with ability to observe the stars and to predict various harvest periods, for example, as we became more and more reliant on agriculture, on being able to plant and harvest, and also when we learned that certain times of the year create better opportunities for planting certain crops, we essentially started to advance our idea of timekeeping to the point where we invented new tools to get better and better at it. And although it may have started as an ability for us to predict when it's best to hunt certain animals and eventually advanced into our ability to create better and better harvests, today timekeeping is everything to us. We deeply depend on it. The mechanical clocks, like the one you see right here, were essentially the premise behind the Industrial Revolution which was then followed by the digital revolution and digital clocks, computer clocks, and then more and more accurate atomic clocks. And today we're actually trying to figure out if we can also use different types of pulsars that sometimes are even more accurate than the atomic clocks to try to measure time even more precisely. But keeping track of time here on Earth and also being able to predict various weather and also various seasonal changes was just the beginning for us. Now we realize we need to be able to do this outside of our planet as well. Specifically, with the advances in the space age, we now realize we need to be able to predict and to also keep track of things happening outside of planet Earth. We need to be able to predict so-called space weather. And when it comes to space weather, there's only one major source of trouble for us, our own sun. And following this very long introduction, this is when we come to the actual thing we're talking about today, solar cycles being able to predict and to know exactly what our sun is going to be doing as the time goes on. So today, we know that our sun just entered a new cycle. We currently refer to it as the 25th cycle, but in reality, it's just our way of measuring these cycles. One of the first astronomers, specifically the Swiss astronomer Rudolf Wolf that you see right here, was the one responsible for coming up with all of this when in the 19th century he was able to collect all sorts of data on various sunspots, even dating back to the observations by Galileo Galilei, 
which allow them to reconstruct these cycles going back to approximately somewhere around here, which is 1745, which represents the earliest and of course the most accurate calculations of the relationship between sunspots and the solar cycles. And obviously he was also one of the first scientists to realize that our sun goes through these 11 year cycles with certain cycles possessing an extremely large amount of sunspots and each cycle ending with the period when the sun was extremely inactive. But back then neither he nor other scientists knew how important it's going to be for us because they didn't really know about the idea of solar storms. And even if they did, they didn't really know how it's going to affect the humanity of modern age. Today the solar activity and specifically the solar storms are one of the potential extreme dangers to, well, modern civilization. A very active coronal mass ejection, for example, could hypothetically send so much energy toward our planet that our whole network of internet, our computer network, our banking system, and everything around us might shut down completely in an instant. I've actually discussed this idea in one of the previous videos you can find somewhere above my head. And so because of these potential dangers, it's really important for us to not only be able to predict when these cycles happen, but also try to predict when the sun is the most active, thus predicting the potential emissions from the sun that could be disruptive to our civilization. Now at the moment when I'm making this video, we are right here. We're actually in the solar minimum. Meaning that this is the end of the cycle and the new cycle has just begun. This also means that currently the sun has the least amount of solar spots or sunspots on it and it also produces the least amount of CMEs or coronal mass ejections. In other words, the sun is currently kind of sleeping. But in terms of the science here, what's happening inside the sun is that it's reversing its polarity. The north is becoming south and the south is becoming north. This reversal is extremely complex and a lot of things happen inside the sun for all of this to occur. As a matter of fact, we still don't entirely understand how all of this happens and learning about this will help us understand how all of this happens on Earth as well. Our planet also reverses magnetic poles once in a while, so trying to understand why and how this happens is sort of important for us. But because we're in a solar minimum, it also means that for the next couple of years we should be okay in terms of the space weather. It's a really good opportunity for us to launch missions, for example. It's also a very good opportunity for satellites or any kind of interplanetary missions. But at some point, the sun is going to become more active, specifically when it's going to reach its solar maxima. And we know that this is going to happen around July of 2025. But what we don't know is how powerful this cycle is going to be. Now, interestingly, when it comes to solar cycles, they do seem to have extremely different strengths. For example, right here in the 1800s, there was something known as the Dalton Minimum, which was when the sun was extremely inactive for many, many decades. There is no actual explanation to why this was so. On the other hand, right after the Second World War, we had the Modern Maximum, which as you can see also lasted into the 80s. And that's when the sun was extremely active and did produce occasional very powerful flares, or to be more exact, coronal mass ejections. One such event occurred in the 80s and hit my home province of Quebec pretty hard. As a matter of fact, there was a major electrical disruption in the entire province and obviously a few other places on Earth as well. But this was obviously before the advances in satellite technology. This was also before the smartphones, the internet and so on. So if something like this were to happen today, yeah, things will not look good for the humanity. Imagine suddenly losing all of your funds that you might have saved in the electronic bank accounts and losing pretty much everything you have on your computer and your smartphone. That's not going to end up well for the humanity. Unless of course you're not even using these tools, which means that you're probably not watching this video, so that means that I'm not probably talking to you, because you can't really hear me right now. Anyway, so the main point here is that it's still very difficult for us to predict the solar weather, but we have improved a lot in the last few decades. As a matter of fact, today we can predict or try to predict the CMEs at least a few days before they happen. Maybe not all of them, but at least some of them. There was a study that I discussed in one of the previous videos that goes through the details of how we can do this today. But what we don't know is how powerful this new cycle, this 25th cycle, is going to be. The current assumption is that it's going to be at least just as powerful as the 24th cycle, which by the way we got really lucky with because nothing major happened here. There was a potential CME coming our way back in 2012, but luckily for us it missed us by just a few days. So in that sense, this was a pretty lucky cycle for us. 
but 25th cycle could be completely different. Considering the fact that everyone today has a smartphone, everyone depends on satellite technology, a lot of us have banking accounts that are only online, we can only imagine that things will not go as well if we can predict a major event from happening and if we can prepare ourselves. And so right now, for at least a few years, we're probably safe, but when it comes to July of 2025, that's when things will get a little bit more serious. We'll have to be prepared for anything that might happen. We don't know how powerful the solar maximum is going to be, and we don't really know if any major events will occur around this period. But just like every other way of keeping track of time, the solar cycles also have patterns that we can predict. We just don't really know how to do it well yet. But predicting space weather and predicting the patterns in space is sort of like the next step in our evolution. We need to be able to predict how the sun will affect our planet and possibly even find a way to prevent it somehow. And what's really interesting is that for the past 700 million years, the sun hasn't actually changed its patterns at all. Based on the fossil data, we've discovered that even 700 million years ago, the sun still had the same cycle. It was around 10.6 years in length. So just like with other ways of keeping track of patterns in time, it looks like we're going to be able to get better at keeping track of solar cycles as well. Or to be more exact, the events that follow the solar maxima. And so in that sense, well, first of all, I guess, happy 25th solar cycle to you. And second of all, there are still quite a lot of mysteries for us. One major mystery, by the way, is in regards to what happened right here. The modern maximum, or the very active sun that we had in the last few decades, currently has no explanation. And the last time that we know something like this happened, at least according to other fossil data, was around 9,000 years ago, right around here during the boreal period. So what exactly causes the sun to be more active or less active? we're still not entirely certain about, but it is something that's really important for us if we want to become an interplanetary and eventually interstellar species. But anyway, so on that note, that's kind of all I wanted to mention. It's a pretty important event in terms of the space sciences and in terms of our understanding of the solar system, and one day it's going to be just as commonplace in terms of measuring time as, for example, a typical clock where we have minutes and hours. One day we're going to start keeping track of solar cycles as well, and hopefully become really good at predicting various solar events. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're returning to Venus once again. Now interestingly, this indescript planet you're looking at, that's essentially Venus. This is what Venus looks like in a telescope. Although in reality, because it reflects about 90% of light, it's actually a little bit brighter even. Hello wonderful person, today we're talking about another discovery coming from this beautiful planet and another discovery that once again suggests something unusual, possibly life-oriented, is happening in the atmosphere of this unusual, somewhat deadly, but also somewhat mysterious planet. So it looks like we've discovered an amino acid, an amino acid known as glycine that surprisingly is very prominent in pretty much every type of life here on the planet. As a matter of fact, you and I right now contain a lot of this glycine in our bodies. One of the most common proteins in our bodies is this right here, this is called collagen. The protein responsible for a lot of different activity in our bodies and something that's essential for our skin, for example. And around 30% of our body is made out of collagen. At the same time, about 30% of this protein is made out of glycine, which also suggests that about 10% of our bodies is made out of this um, amino acid. And even though there are roughly around 5 to 600 amino acids we already know exist in nature, only about 20 amino acids are used by life, including of course us, and this is one of them. So naturally discovering something like this in an atmosphere of another planet is of course extremely exciting. But here we have to be very very careful, because first of all glycine has already been discovered in for example asteroids and comets, as a matter of fact, this comet right here, 81P Wild, is one of the comets where glycine was streaming out at all times. So we do know that glycine exists in space, we also know that it exists in uh, different types of rocks and different types of ices orbiting in space, but we've never really found it on another planet. Like for example, there doesn't seem to be glycine on Mars, at least as of now, and there doesn't seem to be glycine present in either the atmosphere of Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, or uh, Neptune. And obviously Mercury doesn't have any glycine either. 
So discovering this amino acid that's present in all of the or most of the life on Earth and also finding it in the atmosphere of the nearest planet to us where we've already discovered signs of potential life is of course a telltale sign of something strange happening here. Now since the original discovery of phosphine in the atmosphere of Venus, there have been a lot of follow-up papers and most of these papers so far are trying to investigate the reality of the discovery but also are trying to find if phosphine could be produced in some other inorganic ways. One of the recent papers, for example, investigated the idea of volcanic reactions and various types of volcanic eruptions on the surface of Venus trying to find a potential chemical way where phosphine could be generated naturally. And this is actually related to a lot of the comments I've been getting from you wonderful people, especially those of you familiar with chemistry in general, who did point out that, well, there are actually chemical ways for phosphine generation by essentially turning the phosphides, which could be produced by volcanoes, into a type of a phosphoric acid first, and then having that acid disintegrate into phosphine under high temperatures. However, as of right now, the scientists behind the original phosphine discovery still suggest that such reactions would not really be probable in the atmosphere. Personally, I definitely have to do a little bit more chemical research here to discover what exactly it is that's stopping these reactions from happening naturally. For now, we're just going to leave it at that because there are going to be more follow-up papers with more actual chemical investigations of what can and can't happen in the Venusian atmosphere. We're still not entirely clear on how much phosphorus acid there is in the atmosphere. And so while the scientists are figuring out if phosphine could be produced by volcanoes that essentially react with water in the atmosphere and turn phosphorus acid into phosphine, let's really talk about what the scientists discovered now. So glycine, as I mentioned, is a ubiquitous amino acid. It's also the simplest amino acid we have. But despite its simplicity, it is absolutely essential for the proper functioning of many different proteins, and it's the reason why certain proteins are able to create these structures right here, known as alpha helices. In other words, despite its simplicity, it is fundamental to the creation and the complexity of life on our planet. It also seems to have other specific needs for humans as well, like for example, it seems to act as a neurotransmitter and thus play an important role in the neuron activity in our brains and of course other parts of our bodies. But even though it's everywhere and also is extremely important for life, it's not really a biosignature. In other words, it's not necessarily a sign that life is actually happening in that particular location, in this case, the atmosphere of Venus. So even though we've discovered glycine in the atmosphere, and even though we've possibly even found phosphine here, this does not necessarily mean that life was discovered for sure. These are still just independent signs that possibly suggest life, but none of this individually shows us any proof. Nevertheless, there are still some very interesting correlations in their discovery in comparison to the discovery of phosphine. For example, just like phosphine, it was also located in a relatively similar part of the atmosphere, and both the phosphine and the glycine were also mostly found along the equator, not so much, actually not at all, at the poles. In other words, the correlation in the amount of glycine and phosphine was actually quite high in terms of the presence in the same regions. And although here on Earth glycine and phosphine could be potentially signs of life as well, in this case, the natural explanation is still possible. Like, for example, the reason why it could only be present in the equatorial and not the polar regions, as also mentioned by the authors of this paper, is in regards to how atmosphere circulates on our own planet as well. The so-called Hadley cells that you see right here generally push the atmosphere toward the same region and normally toward the equator. So in this region here, you would actually find a lot more different types of mixing and different types of activity, as opposed to in the polar regions where the actual mixing is much lower. So the combination of the slow rotation of Venus with unusually fast winds on Venus could theoretically create Hadley cells that would just push all of the materials toward the equator and all of the chemicals released by the volcanoes would just end up in the equator as opposed to ending up in the polar regions. Yet at the same time, the Hadley cells on Venus would most likely take around 70 to 90 days to circulate the materials here, and this would technically be more than enough for a typical bacterial life to go through all of its cycles of replication and even evolution, and to then spread to other parts of Venusian atmosphere. And the other really unusual correlation is actually in the shape of this graph that you see right here. This shows you the distribution of as you can see glycine 
and phosphine. And the distribution of both of these materials seems to match in terms of the shape of altitude versus the mixing ratio. In other words, what this graph tells us is that they do seem to correlate with one another quite directly. In other words, whatever is producing phosphine could possibly be exactly the same way that the glycine is produced as well. Now that is actually what makes this extremely interesting because on the one hand, this is a direct suggestion that this could be life related. But on the other hand, we could have also discovered some unusual chemical reaction that we've never even thought of before. A reaction that could also be volcanic in origin, that first of all could possibly have nothing to do with life, but second of all would definitely help us understand how these materials are produced in other conditions. And for all we know, we could maybe find a way to use this to produce certain materials here on planet Earth as well. But just a quick reminder, we can't really rush and say that this is a life for sure. Just like with the discovery of unusual formations inside this asteroid right here, where something that resembled life was discovered in the asteroid I think about two decades ago now, back in 1996, and was also an official announcement of the discovery of life on Mars, this turned out to be not really true. This was a chemical reaction producing these, and we were able to successfully recreate them here on Earth as well. We also know that the famous Miller-Urey experiment was able to kind of recreate these initial conditions on planet Earth by combining all of these chemicals with electrical discharge and was also able to produce a lot of these initial amino acids including glycine, or actually a precursor to glycine. So in that sense, this is chemically possible without any life whatsoever. So unless we really send a mission here and get a sample of the atmosphere and try to see if there's anything inside, we're probably not going to know for sure if it's life. But there's still important stuff to learn from these discoveries. And one major discovery that the researchers mention in the paper is that, well, it's possible that Venus is actually undergoing its initial stages of biological evolution. In other words, it's quite possible that this is exactly what Earth was like billions of years ago when the life just started to evolve. And if so, we might actually use Venus as a kind of a very interesting biological experiment to see how life evolves on other planets and to then start looking for similar signs somewhere else out there on other exoplanets. But no matter how you look at it, we kind of are still left with the same conclusion. We have no idea what's going on here, and the only way we can find out what's happening is by sending more missions, more investigations, and also conducting more very specific observations of the atmosphere of this beautiful planet. Because for all we know, these are just our biases. For all we know, there is no phosphine, or phosphine possibly is produced by volcanoes, and for all we know, it's not really glycine we just saw. But maybe, for example, sulfur oxide, which does seem to have very similar spectroscopic features. So in that sense, maybe these are just our biases and our desire to discover life somewhere out there, and we're desperately trying to find every sign of it somewhere near us. So until we actually go here, and until we actually find a way to collect the atmosphere and the samples from Venus, and possibly even analyze them or return them back to Earth, we're not really going to know for sure what's happening in the atmosphere and on the surface of this beautiful planet. So it looks like we might be going to the moon after all. As a matter of fact, uh, we haven't really been back here for quite a while. NASA, as you probably know, has announced their plans to return to the moon with the so-called Artemis mission. And even very recently, the Trump administration announced that they're planning to encourage the mining of the moon, sort of making it official and authorizing the commercial mining of this beautiful object. But around the same time, the so-called USGS, which stands for United States Geologic Survey, released the first ever comprehensive geological map of our beautiful neighbor, of our satellite. So this right here is it, and you can actually find the more detailed picture in the link in the description. But what exactly is this showing us, and how is it different from any of the other maps we've previously had? Well, unlike previous maps, or unlike previous surveys, the USGS version is actually a culmination of 60 years of analysis and thorough investigation of the entire surface of the Moon. And it's essentially a combination of several different studies all in one. This map right here shows us various types of rocks and various types of geological structures on the Moon, as well as their ages and defined features and possible origins. 
And remember, since the moon doesn't actually have any geological activity, like for example, there are no volcanoes here anymore, there are obviously no plate tectonics or really anything else that can actually change the surface, the surface of the moon will most likely maintain all of these features for a very long time, possibly even several billion years. So essentially this is really a kind of a screenshot in a sense of the entire surface that is going to look like this for an extremely long time. Although when I say that there's no geological activity, it's not actually entirely true because we still get the various meteorite and asteroid strikes once in a while. Which becomes even more obvious as you start looking around the surface and discovering all sorts of craters of different sizes. But other than cratering, there's really nothing else geological going on here, at least in the last billion or so years. We do however know that these dark patches on the moon that are essentially facing us were actually formed by the last geological activity, the one that created all of these beautiful maria, or mare as they're also known, or these really dark, well technically oceans of the moon. And they're called oceans or mare simply because we believe that this was actually water before. Today we obviously know that this is not so. We know that this is actually the extremely large leftovers from a volcanic eruption. The eruption that most likely ended around 1 billion years ago, creating this extremely beautiful and extremely bright formation, something similar to what you see right here. And this was all formed by the eruption from within the moon. Now today we believe that all of this happened because just like our planet Earth, at some point the moon had a lot of different isotopes on the inside and some of them were actually producing a lot of heat, essentially melting the inside of the planet and even creating a lot of heat to the outside as well. Today various isotopes is the reason why our planet Earth is still actually hot and will probably maintain the heat for a very long time as well. And at some point some of these isotopes for some reason ended up on the near side of the moon which then created all of these various volcanoes and these really really large oceans of lava that were probably visible for at least a few hundred million years and some scientists speculate that possibly even several billion years. So this was probably an extremely beautiful formation that possibly even looked a little bit like a tiny sun in the night skies. So a lot of early life, if it could actually see the moon, it most likely saw something that was really really beautiful. Not only did the moon reflect the sunlight, it also produced its own light from all of these volcanic eruptions. But anyway, we're getting a little bit sidetracked here. So essentially this was the only other geological activity on the moon, except for of course the asteroids and meteorites that landed here. And so creating this geological map allows us to understand the moon in a lot more detail. And although the main purpose of this map is technically scientific, it's very likely going to be used for commercial purposes as well, which can be seen as both the positive and the negative. So on the one hand, if we decide to commercialize the moon and try to create mining enterprises here, we don't really know what this is going to lead to, possibly another gold rush. But at the same time, when you really think about it historically, this is exactly how our society advanced and how it basically was able to essentially overcome some of the biggest historical hurdles. For example, the colonization of the United States and the spread of colonists in the United States was mostly guided by the idea of mining and looking for gold everywhere. And so the gold rush in the United States led to essentially the development of the entire country. So in some sense, if something similar is created here on the moon, we might see an explosion of different space missions and essentially reach the next stage of human evolution, becoming an actual space species. But what could we possibly even mine here? Well, this is where this geological map comes in really handy. And this is actually why I wanted to talk about these Mare as well. During the Apollo mission, the Americans were able to sample six different areas and collect roughly around 300 or so kilograms of moon rock, which when combined with the samples from the Soviet lunar mission, allowed us to realize what sort of composition the surface of the moon had, and most importantly, what sort of elements were available to us right here on the surface and could possibly be exploited later on. And when combining all of this data from Apollo missions and from the Soviet missions with the data available from other missions, USGS was able to create this beautiful map, dividing the entire surface of the moon into 43 specific units, which can then be sort of subdivided into other categories. 
And although not everything in this map is new to us, like for example we already knew that the darker patches on the moon are actually much younger than the bright patches, which are much much older, actually several billion years older, there are actually a detailed representation of each of these parts, including some areas that we didn't really know about before or were not aware of in terms of the kind of rocks available on the surface, the age of the actual rock, or more importantly, what could potentially be mined there. For example, we now know that there are these unusual gravitational anomalies around some of these mare, and they suggest that there is something really dense on the inside, very likely something metallic or something potentially precious to um, us here on Earth, and something that can definitely be mined. We also discovered really high concentrations of thorium, as well as some of the other so-called rare earth metals. Now, rare earth metals is a very general term that sort of combines different elements, but in a nutshell, these are actually some of the rarest and most expensive elements on the planet, and unfortunately for the US, as of today, most of it is actually produced by China. A huge amount of rare metals come from China, and only a very small part comes from the US and from other countries. And because rare earth metals today are used in pretty much all of the industries that we have, it would actually come to me as no surprise if, eventually, this is exactly what the US decides to mine here. Mostly because what we've discovered is that this part of the moon right here, the one facing us, is basically covered in something known as creep. K stands for potassium, RE stands for rare earth metals, and P stands for phosphorus. All of these elements are exceptionally important for industries today, and finding a way for humans to somehow mine them on the moon, and possibly even make things on the moon on site, would actually completely transform how we produce things here on the planet. And honestly, I wouldn't really be surprised if this is kind of what the Trump administration had in mind when they announced the plans for essentially mining the moon. And this part here also has a lot of other interesting materials, including some really interesting rare metals that we don't really have as much of here on the, on the planet Earth. These parts, for example, have quite a lot of titanium, uh, a lot of magnesium, a lot of calcium, and titanium alone is a good enough reason for us to go and to try to harvest it here on the moon, simply because it's relatively rare on Earth. Not to mention that other parts of the moon, the ones that received different collisions from various asteroids, also haven't really been touched by any geological activity, meaning that whatever came with meteorites and asteroids is still probably there on the surface, which would also make it relatively easy to harvest. Not to mention that there are also a lot of different radioactive materials, including uranium, thorium and potassium. All three are kind of important for various industries on the planet, and would even allow us to create a lot of other on-site reactors and factories on the moon itself. In other words, there are definitely a lot of reasons for us to try to go and make some kind of a mining colony on the moon, even though possibly not everyone would agree with it. Nevertheless, as history showed us before, the commercial enterprise and the idea of trying to make money has always really propelled humanity to new levels. And although colonization hasn't resulted in the best humanity has to offer, Unfortunately, as it looks right now for the space program, it's really probably the only way for us to jump to the next level of space exploration, because if we just focus on scientific studies of the moon, it's unfortunately unlikely to become anything substantial over the next few decades, as we've learned from the past few decades as well. The so-called space race between the US and the Soviet Union and the attempts to do a lot of science on the moon didn't really create anything that you see right here the concept art from 1986. So it looks like the only chance for us to actually colonize the moon is really only the commercial enterprise. And although I don't truly fully agree with this policy, it might be really the only way for us to become a space species after all. And so this geological map will most likely serve us quite well. It might actually allow us to create something really useful on the moon and will potentially propel humanity to the next level. So in the last few years we've discovered quite a lot of things about living on the International Space Station and most of it is actually not so good. Basically it's not really good news. We've already discovered there are some major physiological changes that humans undergo by living so long on the ISS or basically in zero-g conditions. 
and some of these changes are a little bit scary. One of these more scary discoveries from last year, for example, suggested that inside our bodies, if we were to stay in space for a very long time, the heart would actually start pumping blood in the opposite direction, which can result in serious problems in our bodies, including, of course, losing consciousness and basically, possibly even passing out or worse. And we've also discovered some major changes in our genes that happen over time, a lot of which were observed during the so-called NASA's twin study, where these two wonderful people were used as, I guess you would call them, uh, lab rats? Anyway, so we've discovered a lot of different things. And one of the bigger discoveries from the last two years is actually something related to the astronauts' vision. For some reason, most, if not all, of the astronauts experience serious vision problems during their time in space. And in some cases, it even continues when they return to Earth. In other words, something may happen to human eyes or something may happen to the part of the brain that's responsible for vision that causes these unusual health conditions that we actually refer to as SANS, which stands for Spaceflight Associated Neuroocular Syndrome. In general, SANS seems to be different for different astronauts. Sometimes it's just blurry vision, other times it's headaches, and sometimes it's something even worse but related to vision. And so trying to investigate what's happening here and obviously discovering the true reasons has always been sort of the priority for various NASA studies. And so by collecting data from 11 different astronauts, 10 men and 1 woman, over the past few years, the scientists behind this study may have finally been able to find the reason for why SANS happened but they don't really have a solution to it just yet. So let's find out what they discovered. First of all, most of these astronauts stayed on the ISS for roughly around 170 days in total, so a pretty long time. And prior to being launched to the ISS, all of these astronauts have undergone a very thorough analysis, including the brain MRI testing, which allowed these scientists to have something to compare their brains to once they came back. Several more MRIs were done at several different periods, including 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, and so on. And the main idea was to really investigate what's happening with the astronaut's brain as they spend such a long time in, essentially, microgravity, and also in relatively hostile conditions when it comes to, I guess, radiation as well. And the main hypothesis here was that something inside the brain, specifically the pressure inside the brain, was changing to cause these unusual effects. And so by analyzing human brain and by analyzing the brains of these astronauts, they were able to discover that it is indeed true. The brain size seems to actually change and increase by roughly around 2%, which is actually best demonstrated in this little animation they created using the brains before and the brains after. Here you can kind of see the actual volume of the brain slowly increasing. You can kind of see it again right here, it's slowly expanding this part of the brain. Now this is actually really important because the part that's being increased in size is actually related to something known as pituitary gland and also so-called cerebrospinal fluid and white matter, all of which increase by roughly around 2%. So first of all, the pituitary gland that you see right here, it's actually responsible for various hormones that are secreted by our body. These hormones often regulate things like growth, uh, blood pressure, they also regulate sexual activity, water and salt concentration, metabolism, and actually quite a lot of other things. So the changes in this gland could produce quite a lot of various conditions, and some of them unfortunately could be detrimental to human health. White matter, on the other hand, um, is also responsible for, well, technically learning. Now, we don't really know how the increase in white matter affected these astronauts, but it definitely had some sort of effect. We don't know if it's positive or negative just yet, we just know that the white matter volume changed by about 2% as well. And as this video shows, also the volume of the so-called ventricles, basically the empty space inside the brain, where a lot of various um, cerebrospinal fluid is located, have also increased in size. And what's kind of scary is that these changes were permanent, more or less, and they were also kind of occurring even after the astronauts returned to Earth. So in other words, these are more or less permanent changes to their bodies, and we don't really know if they'll ever disappear. But their study also may have found the answer to the so-called SANS, the vision problems. So because the changes in pituitary gland and also just the general changes in the brain were physical, it actually increased the pressure inside the brain. And as you can see from this particular illustration, these changes in pressure here started to put more pressure on this area, 
which is actually responsible for vision in humans. So the increase in pressure very likely caused these changes in vision and basically caused all of these disorders we're observing when it comes to visual acuity in humans in space. The other explanation is that maybe the pituitary gland itself is actually also pressing against the so-called optic nerve, which does pass really close to the pituitary gland, and by increasing in size that area sort of squeezes the optic nerve, causing other visual disorders as well. So in other words, there could be several different effects that are caused by all of this expansion inside the brain. Some of them might be related to brain, and some of them might be related to the actual nerves. But unfortunately this is kind of troublesome, because if an astronaut starts experiencing vision problems on the mission, like for example if we're going to Mars and the mission lasts for about 200 days in zero-g conditions, this might create a problem. If the astronaut is unable to see very well and starts experiencing blurry vision for example, or is completely unable to see what's in front of their face essentially, this will make the mission to Mars or actual mission to anywhere extremely difficult. And since as humans vision for us is the primary sensory apparatus, basically without vision most of us really have trouble functioning, this means that any kind of a mission, prolonged mission in zero-g conditions might need a lot of preparation and possibly a lot of different medicine and drugs. And because the study suggests that the vision will not improve even after landing on Mars where there is some gravity, this of course makes all of this a little bit more complicated. Now luckily NASA has been pretty busy at trying to develop uh, solutions to this SANS problem, and one of them is a type of glasses that um, NASA astronauts can actually wear to try to improve their vision in space. Although they don't look as cool as the ones I just showed you, they look kind of like this. As a matter of fact, an astronaut wearing them does look pretty bad. But it's not always about the looks. It's about looking, right? It's about seeing things. And then there are also certain medications that can be prescribed to astronauts in space to try to improve their vision that way by also decreasing the actual pressure inside their eyes. This is a similar medication that's often used for glaucoma. But despite all of this, it's still kind of early to tell how safe it is for us to actually travel in space for such long periods of time and to try to land on other planets essentially. It will take a lot more experiments on the ISS to try to establish these safety procedures and to try to understand how exactly our bodies change, which seems to be quite a lot by the way, once we spend a long period of time living in zero-g conditions. But luckily the ISS is going to be around for at least a few more years and during that time we'll hopefully be able to discover what is it that we need for us to actually go ahead and start traveling around space in relatively safe conditions. Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and in this video I wanted to give you an idea of what the Japanese space agency, JAXA, was able to recently achieve with its Hayabusa mission that only a few days ago returned the sample from the asteroid known as Ryugu, the second ever asteroid sample ever returned to our planet. And the thing is, this mission by itself is absolutely brilliant. It used a lot of really awesome technology, it also used mission profiles that have never been used before, and most importantly, it was able to return the samples from two different locations on this beautiful asteroid. And when I was watching the live stream from JAXA when they were actually retrieving the samples as they were returning to Earth, I was absolutely impressed by how extremely coordinated the entire process was. You can actually check out their stream by yourself, it's only about an hour and a half long, and it shows you the entire process from tracking the probe to essentially retrieving the samples, including various tools they used in Australia to try to retrieve all of this. Oh, by the way, all of this was done in an Australian desert. And everything about this mission was just absolutely mind-blowing. So first of all, this mission began back in 2014, so essentially six years ago. When the probe left planet Earth, it spent a few years using its ion engine, which doesn't have a lot of power but is extremely efficient in terms of fuel, to try to catch up with the asteroid known as Ryugu. And what's really incredible here is that for this part of the mission, the probe only used up about 30 kilograms of its fuel, xenon. And basically that's how efficient these ion engines were. And by the time that it passed planet Earth, it still had about 30 kilograms left for the second part of the mission, which actually just started. It's not finished its mission because it's still continuing to the next asteroid that it's going to try to visit. But also unlike previous missions and also unlike the mission from NASA that's also trying to capture materials from an asteroid, this mission had very interesting parameters. 
First of all, it was trying to capture these samples from the surface, but also use these very unusual probes, or I guess you can call them rovers, to try to further explore the surface of this asteroid using a very unusual mobility mechanism to roll around the asteroid, and then also use its cameras to try to study the surface here as well. But on top of that, it was also trying to capture materials from within the asteroid. And to do this, it had to somehow get rid of the top layer. And the reason that these inner materials are more important for us is because essentially it allows us to get a sample that's been completely untouched by the solar radiation, for example, for possibly billions of years. In other words, the main purpose of this mission was to get this very pristine, completely untainted material that would be perfect for analyzing the early solar system. But how can you possibly remove the surface of an asteroid and try to reach within it? Well, I guess you could try to dig through it, but because the gravity of the asteroid is pretty low, it's actually a pretty challenging task. Instead of this, Hayabusa 2 probe contained an impactor. Well, basically a bomb on the inside. This small carry-on impactor that's located right there would essentially separate from the probe, and while the probe is waiting on the other side, it would then accelerate smacking into the asteroid really fast, creating a miniature crater. This crater was actually roughly around 10 meters in diameter, and ended up exposing the surface, allowing the probe to capture the material from the inside. In other words, this mission basically bombed the asteroid, creating the crater that was large enough to allow the mission to capture the insides. But at the same time, it also used a very interesting gun-like apparatus to essentially shoot at the asteroid, dislodging the material so that it can then be captured. So in some sense, this is actually a kind of a weapon. It had a bomb on it, and it had a gun to try to shoot at the asteroid. And although the original plan was to try to collect three different samples, unfortunately only two different samples were collected, first sample being from the top from the surface of the asteroid, and the second sample being from within the asteroid. And naturally, I actually wanted to find out more about this whole bomb thing. What exactly did they use to explode the uh, part of the asteroid? Well, apparently what they used was a kind of a copper-shaped charge that within it contained around 4.5 kilograms of HMX, also known as octogen, which is essentially a type of a chemical explosive. And so when the explosive detonated, right around here, it essentially accelerated the shape charge, striking the asteroid at a very high velocity. But I guess what's really unfortunate is that not a lot of material was collected by the probe. And here, the scientists believe that it was only able to capture a few grams of material, meaning that by the time that it's divided amongst various teams around the planet, each of the teams is only going to get something equivalent to a tiny speck, possibly the size of a snowflake. Which actually is really interesting because a lot of the teams that were applying to receive these samples had to prove to JAXA, to the Japanese agency, that they actually have enough experience and enough knowledge dealing with such tiny samples in order for them not to be wasted. A lot of the stuff is extremely expensive and so if a team receives this and they have no idea how to use it, it's basically just wasted on them. But even though the difficult part here was trying to retrieve the samples from the asteroid, another challenge was to obviously try to somehow return them to planet Earth without destroying the samples in the process, which actually has happened in the past. The best example of this, I guess, is the Genesis probe by NASA that crashed in the Utah desert back in 2004. And so in order to return the samples, what JAXA did was essentially use the very similar profile they used in the original Hayabusa 1 mission around 10 years ago. They collaborated with Australian Space Agency and asked them to use the so-called Woomera test range located right here in Australia that, as you can imagine, requires a special permission to be used. And because no one is allowed in this particular area, it's a perfect location to try to retrieve a sample from a potentially dangerous mission coming from space. But because the Japanese agency wanted to continue using the probe for other asteroids, they had to basically separate the sample retrieval from the actual probe itself. So right here, at a distance of about 220,000 kilometers away from planet Earth, the capsule would separate from the main probe with the main probe changing its trajectory so that it can actually pass within about 200 kilometers of planet Earth at a far enough distance where the atmosphere would not change its trajectory by a lot. And to change this trajectory at a far enough distance from planet Earth, the probe just had to basically change its speed by about 20 uh, centimeters per second. 
It basically used almost no fuel whatsoever. And so while the capsule was being returned to planet Earth, the probe continued on its way to the next object. And well, the next part here is of course retrieving the samples. And here it's actually kind of worth watching the stream because it does show you how the scientists were expecting the sample capsule to re-enter right around this time and you can actually see the stream from the capsule as it re-enters the atmosphere. You're going to see it any second now. There it is. So that's basically the capsule entering the atmosphere, decelerating and then slowly approaching the surface of planet Earth. Here's actually all of this happening in slow motion as the capsule decelerates from around 11 kilometers per second down to only a few hundred meters per second. So basically all of this only took approximately two or three seconds. This is extremely, extremely fast. Here's what all of this looked like in real time. And you can kind of see that all of this just took a few seconds. And following this, the capsule had to be retrieved. So the scientists uh, looking for this capsule used a combination of a radar along with the radio antenna and a custom made drone in order to try to locate the capsule and uh, retrieve it as soon as possible. This didn't take long, especially because this drone right here helped to discover it pretty quickly. And within only a few hours, we had this picture where essentially the capsule was retrieved and by the way, all of this protection is because the capsule is potentially radioactive. And the next day, it was delivered back to Japan. But to be more specific, it was delivered to a place known as Extraterrestrial Sample Curation Center. This facility was built specifically for the previous retrieval mission. And today, it's the most sophisticated biohazard proof, or actually biohazard level 3 facility, that essentially is the world's most complex sample processing facility that prevents any kind of a contamination from within or from without. So basically, if by accident one of the asteroid samples contains some sort of a deadly virus, it's not going to spread outside of the lab. And vice versa, the samples collected and stored in this facility will be safe from bacteria and viruses from the outside. But what's interesting is that even NASA is going to be using this facility when the samples from asteroid Bennu return to planet Earth as well. Which basically just means that Japan has become the leader in sample retrieval and of course sample storage and sample distribution as well. And I was actually reading about how all of this is done in this facility and it's pretty crazy what they were able to achieve. They use something called electrostatic manipulation to try to control extremely, extremely tiny samples and essentially use electrostatic effects to either store or to retrieve samples and to essentially distribute them amongst teams around the world. For example, the samples from the Tanpopo mission, which I talked about uh, not so long ago, which was a groundbreaking discovery where the bacteria in the samples survived in outer space for like three years, which you can learn more about in the video somewhere right there, were also processed in this lab and allowed the scientists to study these microbes without the fear of any kind of a contamination. But going back to the Hayabusa 2 mission, as I mentioned, it's not really finished yet. As a matter of fact, it's technically not even halfway done yet. Because the next part of the mission that just began will take it to two other asteroids. But we're probably not going to be retrieving any more samples for them simply because there's just not enough fuel for everything. The first asteroid is going to be visiting is a relatively large Apollo asteroid known as 2001 CC21. It's about 9 kilometers in diameter. And here the Hayabusa mission will probably only be able to take a few pictures. It's not actually going to stick around and it's not really going to orbit this asteroid. It is going to orbit the next asteroid that it's planning to visit in 2031, the asteroid known as 9098 KY26. This one is actually pretty small. It's around this big, it's about 30 meters in diameter, but it's also known as one of the fastest spinning asteroids. Its rotation period is around 10 minutes. And in this particular simulation, you can even see how fast it spins. If you look closely, you'll see that it actually moves pretty fast. This is in real time. And because it spins so fast, the scientists uh, believe that it's going to be relatively challenging to take an accurate or at least a useful picture of this asteroid. But nevertheless, this is going to be a pretty interesting visitation because it's the smallest asteroid we will have ever visited ever. And because of this, uh, in 2031, we're most likely going to be talking about Hayabusa 2 mission once again. But all of us are going to be 11 years older. Anyway, there are still going to be a lot of exciting discoveries Hayabusa is going to be making. And it even has a current mission right now where it's actually trying to study what's known as the zodiacal light. 
It's essentially looking at all of this gas uh, reflecting light in the middle of the Milky Way galaxy, and it's trying to identify certain parameters that are usually relatively difficult to study from planet Earth. And because it's going to be far away from Earth and far away from a lot of other objects, and also because it has relatively powerful um, optical lenses, it's going to be able to study this and help us understand what's really happening in the middle of the Milky Way as well. Although to be honest, at the moment it's not entirely clear what the mission is going to discover in regards to the so-called zodiacal lights. But anyway, on that note, that's all I wanted to mention about the Hayabusa 2 mission. It managed to achieve its uh, primary mission, and now it's going to do its extended mission, going to all of these other objects and trying to take pictures of a lot of other things, other asteroids around the solar system. But all of the other exciting discoveries are actually going to obviously come from studying these samples, and I honestly can't wait for the first study to come out, discovering what it is that these asteroids are made from, and what unusual secrets we discover inside the beautiful asteroid Ryugu. And today we're going to be talking about one of the biggest mysteries in science, the origin of life on planet Earth. And we're going to be discussing the results from a very exciting mission that's been going on for the past three years on top of the International Space Station known as Tanpopo. I've actually talked about this mission briefly in one of the previous videos, but it's finally concluded and we finally have results. And the results are very exciting. The results do suggest that panspermia, or the abundance of life in space, does have some merit after all. In other words, life as we know it may have come from space. So, what exactly is this mission and how do we know all of this? For the past few years, scientists have been detecting a lot of really unusual components, including amino acids, organic molecules, all sorts of stuff, inside asteroids orbiting in the solar system. And although by itself this is not enough to prove the existence of life in space, many of these components are absolutely necessary for life to form on various planets. So one suggestion here is that asteroids did bring a lot of life components to planet Earth. We've also been finding unusual formations like for example this one right here that does resemble some sort of a bacterium although most likely is not one, in various asteroids found here on the planet. This one is from an asteroid discovered in 1984 in Antarctica. But discovering this stuff in asteroids and in outer space is still not enough to prove the existence of life in space. We also have to be able to prove that life can actually survive in space. And so many different studies were conducted on top of the International Space Station, or to be more precise, outside of the International Space Station, to see how much would survive in these very inhospitable conditions in vacuum, in very cold temperatures, and with a lot of radiation as well. One of the more famous participants is of course the so-called water bears, or the tardigrades as they're known scientifically. And to some extent they did survive for at least half an hour to an hour in outer space conditions. But chances are they would not be able to survive for, for example, a month or so. But this didn't stop the scientists from trying this with other objects, specifically with different bacteria because that's what we kind of think might be traveling across space to begin with. And all of this relates to a famous hypothesis known as panspermia. Now the original panspermia was formed back in 19th century, but there are also a lot of different branches of this idea and some of them are more controversial than others. The more extreme controversial branches of this idea suggest that even molecular clouds where stars form and where planets form might be filled with different bacteria. But this has never been proven and chances are things are not really that extreme. As a matter of fact, it's most likely the bacteria doesn't actually exist in these conditions. But there is still a possibility that viruses and bacteria can travel between planets. So for example, maybe from Mars to Earth, from Venus to Earth and vice versa. But to see if any of this is possible, we do have to conduct experiments in space and we have to expose various types of bacteria and various types of organisms to space conditions for prolonged periods of time. This is exactly what the Japanese scientists, who have their own experimental module connected to the ISS, have been doing for several years now. This exposed module right here you see is essentially filled with various types of organisms, in some sense fighting for their life to survive. And different types of fungi, different types of bacteria have already been exposed to space, but so far no conclusive results were found. Then, in 2018, the last part of this mission began, this time using the most extreme bacteria we found on the planet a few decades ago. This bacteria is really interesting, it's known as Dinococcus, 
which has one of these subspecies known as Dinococcus radiodurans. Radiodurans because it's very durable to all sorts of radiation. Turns out this radiodurant bacteria can survive extreme, very extreme radiation conditions that no other species on Earth can survive. And so naturally, this would be the perfect contender to see if they can actually survive in space. The interesting thing about this bacteria and the way that it survives these radiation conditions is first by being able to completely repair its DNA. It's able to bring the damaged DNA into a ring-like structure where the entire strand is then repaired, and it's also able to fuse various nucleotides from outside of the compartment where the damaged DNA is located. This is actually something that we haven't really seen in other species so far, at least to my knowledge. Also interestingly, unlike other species including the previously mentioned tardigrade, the bacteria here does not need to change into any kind of a protective shell or change itself in any way to survive this radiation. The protection that it has is all sort of active. It's able to survive as it receives the radiation and continuously thrive in these conditions. Additionally, as you can see in this image from Guilio Bertoloni from UCLA, the bacteria is able to form relatively large colonies, some of which are almost 1 millimeter in size, which allows for the bacteria to form large enough and thick enough structures to protect some of the bacteria from the radiation by staying inside of the larger colony. In other words, even though some of the bacteria on the outside might perish due to, for example, cold temperatures, there is a chance that the bacteria on the inside might survive after all. Additionally, in the last two years, we've actually been discovering these unusual bacteria even in really, really high altitudes in our own atmosphere. For example, recent discoveries came from as high as 12 kilometers, where there's almost no air, relatively high radiation, and the conditions there are not as hospitable, but the bacteria still seems to survive just fine. And to test all of this, the Japanese researchers left Dinococcus radiodurans on top of the ISS for one, two, and then three years to see how many of these bacteria would survive, if any. And to everyone's surprise, every colony that was larger than about half millimeter in size was able to have at least some survivors on the inside. In other words, even after three years, every colony that was large enough had survivors that then thrived once they were put back onto Earth conditions. And this is a very, very important discovery because it suggests that these bacteria can easily survive inside, for example, a meteorite for at least three years, most likely much, much longer. The assumption that the scientists made right now is that even these colonies that they had right now would have been okay after about 45 years as well. Anything longer than 45 years they're not sure about, but up to about 45 years, at least a few of them would survive for sure. They also think that any colony over one millimeter in size would survive for eight years quite easily. And that of course suggests that, for example, an asteroid from Earth carrying these little guys on the inside could hypothetically deliver them pretty much to most major locations around the solar system, including of course Titan, including Venus, and including Mars. In other words, this definitely gives one of the best proofs so far to the solar system based on spermia. The bacteria can easily travel and survive across vast regions of space for at least a few years, but also vice versa. This bacteria could hypothetically have come from other planets. It could have come from Mars, it could have also come from Venus, and for all we know, the early bacteria from Earth is to some extent extraterrestrial. In other words, it could have come from another planet somewhere in the solar system. Right now, this is obviously very hypothetical, but the possibility is there because of this experiment. But we have to also be careful with the assumptions we make here. It doesn't really mean that life necessarily came from outer space or that it can still travel to outer space. We just know that it's possible, there's a chance. And to discover if it's definitive, we obviously need a lot more experiments and a lot more proof to see if any of these bacteria were ever delivered from or to Mars. And to do this, we actually have to go to Mars or possibly Venus and to try to find some of the stuff there as well. And so maybe in the future, we'll be able to definitively say if panspermia, at least in the solar system, has been happening in the past and if it's still going on now. And so experiments like this are really important for us to understand how the life was created on the planet and how it might continue in the future. But the cool thing about this particular bacteria is that it's just a survivor. It's one of the most difficult bacteria to kill. And because of this, it might have been actually the original bacteria on the planet 
or at least it might be the bacteria that spreads the life across the universe after everything on the planet is gone. And interestingly, because this bacteria is so resilient, back in 2003, the scientists were even able to come up with an idea on how we can potentially store information inside of the DNA of this bacteria to kind of store it permanently to be able to recover it in case of some kind of a major disaster. Back then, the scientists were able to encode a song and turn it into a DNA segment and then recover this song after hundreds and hundreds of generations of the bacteria. So that's something that we might one day be able to use for some other needs. There's a lot of things we can learn from this bacterium and definitely a lot of things we can learn about the life and obviously how it survives and evolves by studying this extremely resilient bacterium. As always, you can learn more about this study as well in the description below. Anyway, for now, that's all I wanted to mention in this video. It's definitely exciting to learn more about how life may have formed on the planet and what might happen to it in the future, but panspermia itself is still a hypothesis and we'll actually discuss some other more dangerous beliefs of this idea in some of the future videos. And today we're going to be talking about a pretty interesting discovery coming out of our own sun that confirms once and for all that our sun has two different ways of generating energy and essentially turning hydrogen into helium. It's a confirmation of what's known as a CNO cycle that's happening inside our sun. But here, let's actually talk about all of this and how all of this connects to our understanding of the universe in general and what it also means to our understanding of how stars evolve as well. Now, today we know that there are a lot of different types of particles out there in the universe and some of these particles are slightly more difficult to detect than others. One of these very difficult to detect particles is the mysterious neutrino that doesn't seem to interact very well with matter. As a matter of fact, it only seems to interact with things gravitationally and through what's known as the weak force. It ignores most of the material as it passes through it, with only occasional interaction as it passes through various objects, which is actually why neutrinos today are used for a lot of different studies. They allow us to study a lot of very powerful things, including black holes, including supernova, including other types of emissions like gamma ray emissions, which are often responsible for producing neutrinos, which in turn then are able to make their way toward the planet Earth because they don't interact with a lot of gas and a lot of different stars and planets on the way. Once in a while, they do interact with our detectors here on the planet, with the biggest one and the most famous one being in Antarctica. The rough simulation of which you see right here, this was made by NASA a few years ago. And so that particular detector has detected a lot of different neutrinos from all over the place and allowed us to understand a lot of different things. But new and more advanced neutrino detectors have been slowly helping us also find neutrinos of different types. And different types of neutrinos are usually produced by different types of very powerful and extremely energetic reactions. Which is essentially what happened very recently when the neutrinos coming from our own sun allowed us to see the different types of neutrinos from what we usually see. Now normally most of the neutrinos coming from the, within the sun are the neutrinos created by the so-called proton-proton fusion process. And despite a somewhat difficult name, it essentially just refers to what we commonly understand fusion to be. Basically when two hydrogen atoms fuse together forming helium and releasing the energy. In other words, that's what we usually learn in school that our sun does in order to create all of this heat. Here's a general schematic of this process, and this is essentially how a lot of different stars, including the majority of nearby stars, create most of their energy. By fusing two hydrogen molecules, it creates helium, it also creates a lot of energy, most of this energy stays within the sun, some of it ends up coming out of the sun, but during this process some of the neutrinos do escape because, as I mentioned, they don't interact with matter very well and then slowly make their way toward our planet, where one of the detectors once in a while catches them identifying their origin. But this so-called PP cycle, for the lack of better term because that's apparently what it's actually called, and feel free to leave your jokes in the comments below, is actually just one of the two fusion processes that the scientists have always hypothesized the stars use to produce the energy. In other words, one of the processes is what we learn in school, two hydrogen atoms fuse, release helium and also release a lot of energy, but there has always been this other process that we believe also happens in stars known as the CNO cycle. CNO obviously being carbon, nitrogen and oxygen. 
and this is a slightly more complex but also slightly more interesting process where the carbon, the nitrogen and the oxygen don't actually get destroyed at all. They actually are recycled constantly, changing from one into another as the cycle progresses and the only difference here is that once in a while a hydrogen will come in, a helium will come out and this process essentially uses up hydrogen and helium once again and also produces a tremendous amount of energy inside the star but using a completely different process and essentially using completely different principles. And because neither carbon, nitrogen nor oxygen disappear from this, it's actually known as a catalytic cycle. It's a cycle where the materials kind of stay intact with only the hydrogen and helium changing in the process. And during a single cycle, this uh, will actually consume four different hydrogen atoms which will also transform nitrogen-15 into carbon-12, back into nitrogen-13, into carbon-13, and as you can see, it actually keeps changing the atom itself, but also constantly regenerating the atom in the process. And as a final result, we get this one atom of helium, we also get two different neutrinos, two different positrons, and also some gamma rays as well. And because positrons usually don't exist around normal matter for a long time, they would then also create more gamma rays as well. But most of this energy produced in this cycle stays inside the star. In other words, all of the gamma rays released here will actually heat up the star, creating the heat on the inside, and only the neutrinos can make it out. And so the theory behind this was always there. And we always believe that um, the main difference between the PB cycle and the CNO cycle is the temperatures needed. So for example, for an object that's roughly around 15 million degrees Kelvin, which is essentially the temperature inside the sun's core, the predominant cycle is going to be the PP cycle, mostly because it usually starts around 4 million degrees Kelvin. In other words, even smaller stars can usually start this process, which is why when a typical brown dwarf reaches a mass of about 80 masses of Jupiter, it has enough temperature on the inside to then initiate the PP cycle and to then basically start uh, fusing hydrogen. But when the temperature is slightly higher, when it's about 17 million degrees Kelvin, this is when the CNO cycle becomes dominant. It actually prefers to have these higher temperatures. And so certain larger stars, like a typical F-type star, will normally have CNO cycle producing most of the helium, with the other cycle, the EPP cycle, becoming very inefficient at these temperatures. And the best example nearby is a star known as Procyon. It's a very, very bright star around 11 light years away from us. This is an F-type star, it's about uh, 1.4 masses of the Sun, and theoretically at least, it should have the CNO cycle as the dominant cycle producing its energy. But because it's kind of far away for us to measure all of this, we don't really know how to confirm any of this. As of, I guess, a few months ago, this was only a theory, there was no physical proof of any of this. Until, of course, now because a very recent paper was able to finally experimentally prove that CNO cycle is a real thing and our sun seems to have a little bit of it going on as well. Which is really surprising because, as I mentioned, CNO cycle starts at around 15 million Kelvin, which is also the temperature inside the core of our sun. And that means that the core temperature of the sun is just at the right level to initiate the CNO cycle, where some of the energy, possibly about 1% of the energy produced, is going to be through the cycle, but the majority of the other energy is still produced in the PP cycle. And the previous theories about our sun suggested that about 1.7% of the entire energy of the sun is produced through the cycle, which would make it extremely difficult to detect because neutrinos are already pretty rare, especially neutrinos coming from our own sun. And so by using a specially modified neutrino detector, by the name of Borexino detector, the scientists behind the paper you can find in the description below were able to definitively prove that the neutrinos found here were coming from the CNO cycle inside our sun and not the PP cycle or any other source from anywhere else in the galaxy. And just as always, being able to confirm a theory that we've had for many many years and experimentally proving something that we knew only from textbooks and only on paper, is actually a huge step forward in once again confirming that our understanding of the universe around us, at least for now, seems to be pretty accurate. Because of the detection and because of this confirmation, we can now rest easy knowing that everything we know about our sun theoretically seems to be pretty accurate in terms of physical detections as well.
the temperature inside our sun seems to be at just the right level to have approximately 1.7% of the total energy generated through the CNO cycle with about 99% of the energy generated through the PP cycle. And that of course is a huge step forward for the science in general. And today we're going to be talking about a potential resolution to one of the biggest mysteries about our own sun. The mystery that's known as the coronal heating mystery. Corona being this region that you see right here around the sun itself. And the easiest way to explain it is, well, okay, we know that sun itself is pretty hot. With the average temperature on the surface being roughly around 5800 degrees Kelvin. But even though this might seem like hot temperature, if you were to move a little bit away from the sun, well actually a few thousand kilometers away from the sun, the temperature would suddenly increase quite a lot by almost a thousand times. In other words, the temperature of the so-called corona, once again this region that you see around the sun, is anywhere from 1 million to 2 million degrees Kelvin. And that's a huge difference. And it was actually very difficult for early scientists and even for the scientists today to kind of explain all of this. But the best explanation of what's possibly happening here actually came from the really famous solar astrophysicist Dr. Eugene Parker. You probably know him because the solar probe known as the Parker Solar Probe is named after him. Now, his theories back in the 70s suggested that all of this heating could be explained if we imagined that the surface of the sun was actually covered in these really, really tiny miniature nano explosions, or more precisely nano flares as he referred to them. And these nano flares, if they were powerful enough and also if they were pretty much across the entire surface of the sun, could hypothetically explain how the sun can maintain such very high temperatures above its surface. But the problem here is that, well, these nano flares would be really, really tiny and they would be relatively difficult for us to see. And most importantly, there's really no actual proof of their activity on the surface unless we can somehow zoom into the surface of the sun and see them in action. So in other words, the theory here was just a theory. There was practically no way to actually prove it until, I guess, more or less recently. It just so happens that the modern telescopes reached an ability to really zoom into the surface of the sun and see a lot more detail that we've never been able to see before. I guess the best example here would be the picture taken by Daniel Inui telescope a few months ago. But just looking at the surface of the sun is unfortunately not enough to prove any theory, because most of these theories do sort of explain all of this as an interaction between, for example, magnetic fields, interaction between various very, very hot particles, and also interactions of the magnetic lines as they snap on the surface of the sun. But all of these micro snapping events are basically really, really difficult to see. And so a lot of various observations are required for all of this, and some of the recent observations from this beautiful satellite known as IRIS or Interface Region Imaging Spectrograph allowed us to take several very, very precise images of the sun in various frequencies, which also finally allowed the scientists behind this paper that you can also find in the description below to kind of sort of finally explain what could be possibly causing the corona of the sun to be so extremely ridiculously hot. And once again, the explanation here is in regards to the nano flares. But in this case, it does involve a few more additional explanations. So we believe, at least for now, that the corona is actually heated by these tiny, tiny explosions all across the surface of the sun. But just like a typical large solar flare, which you can sort of see forming right here, they are essentially a result of various magnetic line interactions. But unlike a solar flare, these nano flares will usually have very, very small magnetic fields snapping and also interacting with one another extremely fast in very, very small nano flare events. These nano flare events essentially convert the magnetic energy of the magnetic lines inside the sun into kinetic energy, which essentially kind of throws out a lot of very, very hot material, which then ends up heating up the corona. So it basically converts the magnetic energy into the plasma energy of the region around the sun. And a lot of this energy is carried to these regions by the larger magnetic field lines that kind of basically serve as a delivery system to these farther regions. 
But all of this is obviously a lot more complicated. So for example, to mathematically explain all of this and to explain the heating of the corona, we would actually expect roughly around 50 of these really powerful nano flares in the region equivalent to Earth you see right there. And that's every single second. And they would also have to be really, really powerful. But because of the sizes here, because of the actual tiny, tiny minuscule nano flares that we're talking about here, it would be really difficult for us to prove this or to see this in action. And so up until now, this was just a theory for many, many decades. But thanks to some of the recent observations, we might have actually finally witnessed it in action. So when the scientists behind this paper zoomed into some of the images from Iris satellite, they did witness certain unusual loops that were incredibly hot, millions of degrees hot, with the heat itself being distributed in a very unusual and a very peculiar way, with some of the tiny regions on the surface of the sun being extremely hot, millions of degrees hot, yet other regions being extremely cold, only a few thousand degrees. And this unusual distribution of heat and these very strange formations could only really be produced by some sort of a magnetic line interaction. There's really no other explanation to what's happening here. But these are extremely minuscule and very, very tiny formations. Can these really be these nanoflares or at least the formations that are created by the nanoflares? And most importantly, did this event in some way influence the corona afterwards? Because without the connection between corona and these unusual observations, we can't really speculate if one influences the other. For all we know, maybe this is just another mystery on the surface of the sun. Well, it turns out that the connection has been made. Here's what the scientists saw. First of all, they discovered that these very strange interactions turn somewhat cool plasma into super hot plasma practically in an instant. They kind of compared this to taking an ice cube and realizing that in a single instant this ice cube has become like a thousand degrees celsius. Basically super super hot. Okay, not the right ice cube here. And this is of course the effects from the magnetic line interaction and the magnetic line snapping. The magnetic energy becoming super hot plasma. But did this somehow affect the corona above it? And this was of course the difficult part to prove. Here the scientists had to look at the region above the surface where they witnessed this unusual event and try to see if the temperature of this region changed as well. And having made the observations right above this region, the scientists realized that it did indeed change temperatures quite a lot. It took approximately 20 seconds to deliver all of this heat to these regions, but they observed it 10 separate times, and every time it seemed to have increased the temperature of the corona, suggesting that maybe indeed these observations right here are these nano flare events, the events responsible for heating up the corona. But unfortunately, at the moment, we cannot really definitively say if this is the only event that's doing all of this and if this is the only event responsible for the heat corona receives. Because the only way we could actually prove this is if we could somehow see these events across the surface of the entire sun. Because entire corona, or at least the major part of corona, is extremely hot. If we can somehow witness these events happening across the entire surface, that would definitely explain everything. For now, we only have observations from a relatively tiny region of the sun, and that's just not enough to prove this as an actual fact, because at the moment we only have these observations from a relatively small part of the solar surface. But that's not all, because the scientists were able to, even to some extent, explain how all of this is happening. It's somewhat difficult to understand how is it that the heat doesn't just stay on the surface of the sun, why does it actually transfer to these outer regions? And the explanation here comes from the idea that the sun isn't just made out of hydrogen and helium. It also already has produced certain other elements such as oxygen and silicon. And these uh, elements are, well, they're heavier. They're much heavier than hydrogen and helium. Because of this, they have more momentum if they have more energy. And what's really, really interesting here is that by observing these differences in different elements being present and being shot out by these magnetic interactions, the scientists surprisingly discovered that things like, for example, hydrogen and helium, and even things like oxygen, which are relatively light, didn't really get that far from the surface. They basically kind of stayed at the surface and eventually cooled down. But things like silicon, which are heavier elements, ended up shooting out of the surface of the sun at speeds of about 100 kilometers per second, literally moving thousands of kilometers away from the sun and thus heating up the outer regions that we refer to as corona. And the explanation here is, well, once again magnetic. As the magnetic lines interact and as they snap, 
they end up accelerating these ions, which acquire a lot more momentum than lighter ions, which literally just allows them to push their way through all of this lighter material. In other words, heavier elements with more energy inside have a higher chance of leaving this region and are not stopped by anything like hydrogen or helium, whereas the lighter atoms just don't have enough momentum to leave the surface of the sun. And the longer these silicon atoms or silicon ions move along these lines, the more momentum and the more heat they acquire. And eventually all of this heat makes its way toward the solar corona, where it essentially creates these really hot regions based on all of this really hot silicon. Although theoretically a very specific ratio of silicon to oxygen would have to be present in these locations. And according to the scientists behind this paper, they did seem to discover the exact proportions needed for all of this to work as well as I just described, as they describe in their paper. In other words, it does seem like we might have finally explained how corona work at least to some extent. This is still a very preliminary discovery and it still needs to be proven with other papers. But as it stands, we might have finally solved a mystery of, well, several decades, since the original proposition in 1978. But once again, in order for us to prove all of this, we would now have to really kind of zoom in to the surface of the sun and also be able to see all of these very powerful events happening all over the sun in order for us to account for the extreme heat of the entire corona. But we're kind of far from being able to do all of this. We still need to have even better telescopes, even better satellites, and a lot more observations of various very tiny events happening on the surface of the sun. And today we're going to be returning to the most mysterious and probably most interesting moon in the solar system, the moon of Saturn, Titan. Because once again something unusual was discovered on Titan, but this time it's something we've never actually seen anywhere else on any other planet or any other moon in the solar system. As a matter of fact, it's something that seems to only exist in the interstellar space. So let's talk a little bit more about this because this is actually really, really exciting. First of all, Titan itself for a very long time has been kind of speculated to possibly have a life on it. Mostly because of the unusual observations of uh, methane changes and some of the other unexplained molecules we've discovered here, a lot of which need to be replenished for them to exist. Just like with the recent phosphine announcement that coming from Venus, for example, where we know that for phosphine to exist, it needs to be somehow replenished, very similar discoveries uh, in the last few years suggested something similar on Titan. But unlike Venus with its extremely hot and very highly pressurized atmosphere, filled with all sorts of acids on top of that, the atmosphere of Titan is unique in its own different way, almost the opposite actually. First of all, it's obviously extremely cold here. Notice how the temperature actually decreases the closer to the surface you get, until this point 40 kilometers above the surface when it suddenly starts increasing once again. And with the really really cold temperatures on the surface here, which are around minus 180 degrees Celsius or about minus 290 degrees Fahrenheit, it's a little bit difficult to imagine that the life could possibly exist here. But nevertheless, it is possible simply because of the different chemical composition and also different reactions taking place here. We know, for example, that there are active lakes here. There's also a kind of a liquid cycle, except that instead of water, it's methane and ethane. And we also know that the atmospheric pressure is about 1.5 atmospheres. So it's thicker than planet Earth. As a matter of fact, the mass of the atmosphere on Titan is even heavier than the atmosphere of planet Earth, despite their size differences. So this is a pretty exciting object. It does seem to have a lot of potential for unusual life. And it also seems to have a lot of different types of chemical reactions on its surface. And except for the Moon, Venus and Mars, it's also the only other outer solar system object where we've actually managed to land on and to take a lot of really interesting pictures from the surface for at least a few minutes. This is of course from the famous Huygens probe that landed on Titan, which was part of the Cassini mission that ended a few years ago. And this is basically what the surface here looks like with the rocks that you see here being ice water. Actually, slightly different ice water from what we get on Earth. The structure is a little bit different. But in the recent study, the scientists finally identified something else that just doesn't make sense. They used the radio telescopes from Chile, uh, part of the ALMA, which stands for Atacama Large Millimeter Array, uh, 
the network of about 66 different radio telescopes that for many years now allowed the scientists to study the universe in radio waves. And this time they looked at Titan and tried to see what sort of molecules they'll be able to discover by just studying the radio emissions coming from the moon. And what they discovered doesn't really make sense right now. It's this molecule right here. It's a molecule that apparently even a lot of chemists on the planet don't really know anything about, because we don't have it on the planet, we also don't seem to have it in any of the other planets near us, and so far Titan has been the only object where we've discovered it, except for also occasionally seeing this molecule in the interstellar space. And this molecule is known as cyclopropenylidine, a very difficult name to pronounce, took me a few tries actually, and, as you can imagine, it's the first time I've ever heard of this molecule. In some sense, it seems to be relatively similar to benzene, essentially it's a cyclical molecule, but unlike benzene that has 6 carbons and 6 um, hydrogens, this one has 3 carbons. And also, weirdly enough, it only has 2 hydrogens, so its actual formula is C3H2. It's a molecule that we don't really know anything about, because it's only been ever produced in the laboratory, and it's never really been used in anything. And we know that the molecular clouds usually contain this molecule, we've seen it in some of the previous surveys, but the problem here is that we can explain why it exists in the molecular cloud, but we can't really explain why it exists on Titan. This molecule is extremely reactive. It does not exist for a very long time because it just finds something to react with, and essentially becomes some other organic molecule. It's sort of like, you could almost call it a foundation for a lot of other organic molecules, essentially a Lego block for organic chemistry. But it just doesn't make sense that it would exist completely by itself in the atmosphere of a planet that already has extremely active chemical reactions going on at all times. Right now, we can't really imagine what could be happening on Titan to produce this molecule. But it definitely seems to be there, and it seems to be the second cyclical molecule present in the atmosphere of Titan. But how certain are we that it is there? Well, to confirm all of this, the scientists in the study actually analyzed the older data from the Cassini mission, and they were able to discover something that looked very similar to this molecule in the spectrum from Cassini as well. The Huygens Cassini mission discovered a similar form of this molecule in the atmosphere, but it was actually charged, it was ionized. So it was C3H3 with a slightly positive charge. And this actually confirms that the molecule exists and does seem to interact with something. Although in this case it probably just interacts with the sun which ionizes the molecule, creating a chain that then creates other molecules. But naturally, because this molecule is so extremely reactive, it really shouldn't exist, it should have already reacted with everything. So something is producing it continuously and something is emitting it into the upper atmosphere. And so even though in a typical molecular cloud we know that it can exist because there's just not enough material to react with anything, on Titan it seems to exist because something is actively creating it. What is that something? How is it actually being made? And even though the existence of this molecule explains how some of the more complex chemistry can happen, and how some of the more complex organic molecules can be created from this simple molecule, this still obviously tells us nothing about its origins. And trying to understand what's happening here is actually really important, because we kind of believe that, uh, in some sense, the atmosphere of Titan today does represent what Earth was like many, many billion years ago, before the oxygenation event and before life became prominent. So maybe this is actually what Earth possessed as well, or maybe there is some life producing these molecules right now, or using these molecules in some other way, possibly as a food source, possibly as an energy source. And although, I guess in some sense, we could explain this as maybe some kind of a solar reaction, or basically the radiation from the sun acting on various organic molecules in the atmosphere of Titan could maybe produce some of these, but how come we don't see this happening anywhere else in the solar system? It doesn't seem to happen on Jupiter or Saturn, where a lot of really complex chemistry goes on pretty much every second, and also where phosphine has been found as well but we still can't really explain why this seems to be the only object so far where this unusual molecule has been discovered. Earth obviously doesn't have anything like this either. And chances are, we're not really going to know anything about this discovery or about the origin of this molecule until the beautiful Dragonfly mission. NASA has been kind of planning this for a few years now, we still don't really know the details, but 
Chances are that it is happening because Titan does seem to be an exciting place to visit and it also seems to be the moon with the most mysteries and possibly also alien life. Which is why NASA and a lot of other scientists around the world has been so excited to find a way to launch this mission sometime soon and to essentially investigate this beautiful moon and also find a way to possibly one day for humans to visit it as well. Although at least for now I guess we can only dream.